quite a bit. So being a landscape photographer, there's not always something you can go out and shoot. So instead, uh, pick up some flowers, and flowers are great. They're, they hold still for you as long as you want. They're very patient, uh, unlike a person. They let you experiment with different techniques and different lighting. It's a great way to learn, and it's a pretty inexpensive way to spend a Saturday or a Sunday. And You don't even have to have a big fancy studio to do it. Most of the flower pictures that I shoot, I actually just shoot at home with a simple table lamp or sometimes even just a flashlight. Uh, you do want to make sure you have a tripod. That definitely helps out um, so that you can keep everything consistent. Oftentimes you might be blending multiple exposures or blending uh, multiple focus points together in multiple images. And we'll talk about doing some of that today. I was just going to show you a few quick examples of some uh, flower pictures. I don't claim to be an expert, but uh, it is certainly a hobby that I enjoy. I think Liz probably shoots some flower photography as well. I think everybody does at times. Oh, yeah, definitely. Let's go ahead and jump in and get started here. Cool. Uh, you notice I'm using the Perfect Photo Suite today to keep track of my images. You don't have to do that. You could use the, the browse module like I'm using here, or you could use Lightroom or Aperture or your file system, or just open your images straight through Photoshop. Once you've got the image open, the process of using the Perfect Photo Suite is the same no matter which way you get your images into the suite. So I'm just going to come back here to my browse module, and let's get started here. Let's pick an image. Let's use this daisy here. I'm just going to pick the image I want to work on, and then I'll just click up here in the module selector where I want to go. I'm going to click on layers. I tend to like to work through layers. That way I can um, keep all of my work on their own separate layers. I'll show you how that works here in a second. When you select an image and you open it, you're prompted. Do you want to work on the original image or kind of copy, or do I want to add it as a layer? So if I want to take multiple images and merge them together into one layered file, I can do that here with this third add as a layer option. I'm going to use the edit uh, copy option. I'm going to make sure that I'm working in a Photoshop format. The reason I want to work in a Photoshop format is it lets me save each layer. And again, that's how I keep track of my work and my history. So let's go ahead and open this image up into layers. Now there's the original camera, our original image right out of the camera. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to name my layer. I'm just going to call this original and I'm going to make a copy of it. That way, no matter what I do, I can always get back to my original image, which is down here at the bottom. So, uh, I see a couple questions over here in the questions module. One was, uh, what backgrounds and lights do I use? And it, it kind of varies. Uh, most of the time, I'm not actually in our studio. My, my wife has a studio, and if it's a, uh, a day where I really want to get into it, I'll go down to the studio, uh, and I'll use her professional studio lights. But a lot of the time, I'm either just using window light, or I'm just using a table lamp. Uh, because I'm working on a tripod and I'm working with a fairly small subject and a very narrow depth of field, you can get away with quite a bit. And it's actually kind of fun. It's a challenge to see what you can get away with. What's the minimal amount of gear that you can use to create things. Uh, and in terms of the background, it's usually just whatever the wall is behind. And uh, I let it go out of focus. And either I'll add a light to it or not, depending on whether I want to lighten or darken the background relative to the subject that I'm photographing. All right. And another question was, what is the ultimate goal? Uh, you know, typically I will print these uh, for myself. And it might just be part of a rotating collection that will hang in my office or hang at home. All right, let's get back to it here. So I've made a copy of the original. That way I can always get back to it. The next step is to go in and clean up some of these imperfections. You'll almost always have imperfections in flowers. It'll either be a, a petal that is wrinkled or has a blemish on it. So we need to go in and get rid of these or at least soften them up a little bit. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. And I find that the best tools for doing that type of retouching on flowers, I'm going to close the left hand drawer here so we have a little bit more preview area, is actually the retouch brush. There's three different tools for retouching in the suite. There's the perfect eraser. That's a content aware fill tool. It works great if you're trying to remove uh, a larger object or if you have something where you really want to maintain the exact detail around it. The next one is the retouch brush. This is the one that I use the most often. It's the fastest, 
tool and on small areas it tends to do the best job. And it's also the best for doing dust spots. So I'm just going to make my brush a little bit bigger. I'm using my bracket keys on my keyboard to make my brush bigger and smaller just like you do in Photoshop or Lightroom. The left bracket key makes it smaller and the right bracket key makes it bigger. You can also do that right up here in the size pop-up. There's a slider that you can control how big it is or you can type in a number or there's a scrubby slider right here where you can click on the word size and drag left to right. It'll make your brush bigger and smaller. Lots of different ways to do it. And then to start to remove these little marks, I'm just going to paint across them. Now the retouch brush kind of infers motion, so you always want to paint uh, perpendicular to the thing that you're trying to get rid of. So you notice rather than painting along the line, I'm painting across the line. And this will, oops, didn't do as good a job on that one, did it? Use a smaller brush if you're not getting the results that you want here. There we go. I'm also zoomed in pretty close here. And on this image, what we're going to do, a lot of these little imperfections, you're not going to see because we're actually going to add a glow to this at the end here. So I'm just going to clean up a few of these annoying little spots here. And this is one of those times where I feel like I should hum for you guys because it's kind of boring watching me retouch dust spots. I actually have a really good question for you while you're removing dust spots. Sure. Maybe you could just, <clears throat> sorry, maybe you could just make a little bit of a comment about when in situations like this, you would probably swap over to the perfect eraser versus using the retouch brush. You bet. Uh, the, the easiest rule on that is of when you pick which tool to use uh, is kind of a hierarchy of tools. I'll always start with the retouch brush because again, it's the fastest one. There's no waiting. It's the easiest thing. You just dab it on the thing you want and it will usually go away. When I'll use the other tools like the perfect eraser is oftentimes when I come to an edge. Let's see if there's a good example of a spot. So like right up here along this edge, if I was to paint across the edge with the retouch brush, it's going to smear it. I'm not going to have a nice clean edge that's a perfect time to use the perfect eraser. Instead, it does a much better job of maintaining edges and lines. So it takes a second more for it to apply, but it's more respectful of those edges. And then of course the clone stamp tool, the third one is kind of like when all else fails, the clone stamp tool is your go-to tool. It requires more user intervention. You have to pick your source and your destination, but it allows you to get exactly what you want in any scenario. Hopefully that helped a little bit. All right, I'm not going to get rid of everything. You guys have seen how to dust spot before. So there we go. I've gone through and I've removed some of those distractions. You can see there's before, there's after. I've just minimized those a bit. Now I'm going to send my results to Perfect Enhance. So I just click up here on Enhance in the module selector. There we go. And what I want to do in here is set my white and my black points of the image. I want to make sure that it has some real highlights and some real shadows. And the best way to do that is just to click the auto level button right here. And this will automatically detect the white and black levels and set them. You can see what those are going to look like if you hold down the J key on your keyboard or you can go up to the view menu and select show clipping. And that will turn a clipping view on and as you adjust these, Anything that goes pure black will turn blue. So as I bring that black clip up, anything that's blue will be a pure black in my image. So I can just adjust that until I get just the amount of black that I want. I want to have just a tiny little bit of black right here in the shadows. Same thing with the whites. I can adjust those whites up. And as I turn them up really high, anything that turns red is turning pure white. Now, I really don't want any of that red to appear because I want to keep all the subtle little highlights in the flower. So I'm going to adjust it so I just don't see any red at all. There we go. Hit your J key to turn that on and off. Let me just preview that before and after so you can see the difference. So there's before, it's a little bit flat. There's no real whites or blacks in this scene at all where once the contrast is adjusted, it just adds a little bit of pop to the image. I actually want even a little bit more detail in my highlights. An easy way to do that is just to grab the highlight recovery slider and turn it up a little bit. And this will just push those highlights down a little bit more. So we get a little more detail 
here in a little bit more detail in the white fuzz along the stem. There we go. All right, now I'm done in Enhance, and I'm going to go off to Perfect Effects. But before I go to Perfect Effects, I just want to see if there's any questions about Perfect Enhance. Mm, does not look like it. Didn't look like it. All right, now let's go to Effects. All right, now, here inside of Perfect Effects, this is where you get to start to decide what you want to do with the image from an artistic standpoint. What I want to do is I want to increase the visual difference between the petals that are yellow and soft and very feminine and the green stock, which is much harder and masculine. So I want to really isolate these two areas and push them further apart visually. So the first thing I want to do is I want to enhance the stem. I'm going to use the adjustment brush to do that. To me, the new adjustment brush and the new adjustable gradient tool in Perfect Effects 8 are probably the ones I use 80% of the time on every image. They're the most flexible uh, tool. So I'm just going to click on the adjustment brush. When I do that, my tool is going to automatically turn over to the brush tool. And down here at the bottom are the controls for adjusting the adjustment brush. There's some presets at the top. So I can brush things lighter or darker or more vibrant or more detail. But then all the sliders below, I can fine tune it to do just what I want. I want to start off by increasing the detail. So I'm just going to click on the detail preset. You notice nothing changes in my image when I do that. Not until I start to actually paint on it. I'm just going to make my brush a little bigger, again, using those bracket keys. And I'm going to toggle on the perfect brush. The perfect brush automatically masks for me. So as I paint, it's only going to apply this effect to the colors underneath the center of the brush. I'll show you what this looks like here in just a minute. I'm just going to paint down the center of the stem. I'm going to turn the mask preview on, which you can do from this little pop-up right here. There's a couple different ways to preview the mask. I'm just going to select mask red. And you can see as I paint, it's automatically stopping the masking just at the edge of the colors that I'm interested in. So it's kind of a self-masking, self-feathering tool. It's super handy. There we go. I'm just going to keep painting in here. Sometimes using these mask preview modes can really help you see just where you're getting with it. Now, if it creeps out into an area that I don't want it to go, you notice like right along here, I'm starting to get into the background a little bit. All you do is hold down the Alt key or the Option key on your keyboard, and it changes the paint mode temporarily for you. Right now I have it set to Paint In, but if I hold down the Alt key or the Option key, it's going to toggle it to Paint Out temporarily for me. So now I can just paint those little areas back in, paint that mistake back in, still using that perfect brush technology. There we go. I'm just going to turn that mask off for a minute. And now we can see just our results right there where we've enhanced the detail. Now all we've done really is just increase the detail with this detail slider. Let me turn it off. So there's before. I'm going to turn it really up high so you can see how we're just enhancing the detail. I'm going to pick a more modest setting, maybe somewhere around 40 or 50%. I'm going to bring up the compression a little bit. What compression does is it evens out the tonal scale. It pushes the highlights down and brings the shadows up. It, think of it kind of like HDR, but you could just brush it in just where you want it to go. So I'm going to bring that compression up and maybe a little bit more detail. And I'm going to bring the contrast down just a little bit. There we go. So that lets me dial in just the look that I'm interested in just for the stem. Now I want to go and I want to add an opposite effect to the petals on top. I want to add a warm, soft, glowing effect. I'm going to click the plus button at the bottom of my stack. That'll add a new empty effect layer. And now we're going to go shopping for a glow. And you can do that over here on the left-hand side. I'll just glow to the glow category. And I'm going to use the Quick View browser. You notice that I mouse over each of these categories. There's a little icon on the side. When I click on that, it brings up the Quick View browser. You can always open these categories up and see thumbnails this way, but it's kind of a small strip. 
The Quick View browser, on the other hand, takes over your entire screen and it lets you have a nice big preview of all the different effects. So you can kind of look through here until you find the one that you like. I'm going to go for one called Deep Forest right here. There we go. I'll click to add that. Now, I really like what that has done up here to the petals, but it's kind of reversed the work that I just did on the stem. So watch this trick. We're going to take the mask that we created for the stem, and we're just going to copy it up to the next layer, and then we'll flip it around so that it applies to the glow to everything except for the stem. So here's how you do it. Click back on the layer that has the mask that you're interested in. Click in the mask thumbnail, and then drag it up and that will paste the mask into the upper layer and turn the layer back on. Now, right now, the mask is applying the glow just to the stem. That's the opposite of where I want it. So we'll go to the mask menu and select invert mask. There we go. Now it's applying the glow to everything except for the stem. And there's our final image. Let's take a look at the before and the after here. So there's before and there's after. And of course, you can fine tune any of these steps. Maybe I will go with just a little bit more saturation, a little bit more warmth, and a little bit stronger glow on the flower. There we go. All right, I'm going to pause here for a second and see if we have any questions out there. Liz? There was, there was a question in there about how you could change how you view your mask. Um, you kind of jumped into the, the viewing your mask on red, but maybe you could show the mm -hmm. couple of other options that you've sure. got in there. Yeah, I'm just going to close the preset drawer on the left so we have a little bit of room. You can just grab the little divider right here and drag it to the left to close that up. And I'm going to click right down here in the bottom. There's a little A for after. If I click on that, I can go through different split screen views. And I'm going to set it to a left-right compare. So the right-hand side shows my after. The left-hand side shows my before. I'm actually going to now toggle through the different uh, mask modes over here on the left-hand side so you can see what they look like. So the mask red is the one that I was using before. That's the one that I tend to use the most. And it allows you to show uh, anything that is masked, anything that's hidden, uh, will appear in red. You can also view it in white, or you can view it in a dark overlay, or the traditional grayscale mask, just like that. And working in this type of a view where you can actually see the results and the mask while you work can be really handy. And there we go. And of course, you can toggle through those different preview modes. There we go. All right, let's move on to our next image. I'm just going to cancel out of this one. One thing you'll notice is that at each step in my layered process, it's created a layer for me. So even though I canceled out of Perfect Effects, my results from Enhance are there on their own layer. And if I uh, had applied in Perfect Effects, I'd have another layer for Perfect Effects on top. That way I can always throw away my last results and go back to the previous step and make adjustments if I want to. All right, let's close this image. Let's go back to Browse and find the next image that we want to work on. Um, let's do this one. Let me zoom in a little bit on this image so we can take a look. This is one of those kind of a, a happy accident, if you will. This is a, it's a calla lily. It was uh, just photographed in front of a window with a green wall behind it. Uh, don't ask me why I have a green wall. But it's very soft. It has kind of this uh, this pastoral feel, but it's flat and it's off color. I, but I've got a feeling that this image has some, some good bones to it. Let's go ahead. I'm going to start by sending it to perfect layers. Again, I always use that Photoshop option so that each step is isolated on its own layer. There we go. Again, I'm just going to call this original, make a copy of it. That way I can always get back to my original. I'll grab that handy dandy retouch brush and I'll just grab any little dusty spots that I see. Whenever you have these solid backgrounds in an image, they will pop out and get you. There we go. That's kind of a good start. Now, I think this image will look great in black and white. So I'm going to send this to perfect black and white. There we go. 
And it's like, wow, right off the bat, I've got a completely different feeling image just by converting it to black and white. Now this uses the built-in presets, which is just going to set the white and the black point for me automatically. I can go through and I can adjust all the settings and there are settings for every black and white thing you would ever want to do. If you're a black and white darkroom nerd like me, every toner, every technique, that you, every film grain type that you want is over here on the right. I find it a lot easier just to go over here to the left where the presets are. And again, I'm going to use that handy little quick view browser and it'll let me preview and get great ideas of the different things I could do with this image using some of the built-in presets. So we can just kind of scroll through and take a look, maybe find something we'd like to do. Maybe I want to do just a very straight up platinum print like I would have created with platinum in the dark room. You can even see the edges or, well, no, maybe I change my mind. Maybe I want something even softer and more pastoral. Maybe we'll go with this cyano type look. There we go. Very soft, very feminine. It's got a beautiful blue palette to it. Now we can start to adjust it. Here's what I want to do to adjust it. I'm going to start off and use the targeted brightness tool. The targeted brightness tool lets you change the brightness of areas in the image based on their underlying color image. Now I'm going to turn the preview off for a second. You notice the original image is kind of predominantly made up of two colors, just green and yellow. So I can make the white or the green lighter or darker using this targeted brightness tool. I want to take the green background and make it darker. So all I do is I click with the targeted brightness tool on the greens and I drag to the left to make them darker, just like that. The other thing I want to do is I want to bring up some of these detail in the leaf. You see it's got these great subtle veins in it. I'll just use the detail slider and I'll just turn that up. If I crank it up really high, it'll look kind of artificial, but I want to pick something where I can kind of see and feel those, but not going too crazy. Maybe something like that. So there we go. Let's take a look at the before and the after. So the original on the left and then our results on the right. Just like that. Any questions? This is a very simple one. There was a really good question about ah, question about where is that? Oh no, you got it. Go for it. Go ahead, Liz. <laughs> oh, uh, what the uh, target brightness tool is? Yeah. Uh, the target brightness tool is the fourth tool down in the tool well. So the top one is a brightness brush. It allows you to burn and dodge, so you can lighten or darken selective areas. The next one is for contrast. The next one is for detail, so you can paint detail in just where you want. The fourth one, that's that target brightness tool. That's the one that I like to use a lot of the time because it really lets you lighten or darken those different colored areas. I'll show you how to use it again. I'll just click on the image, click in the area that you want to change. So again, if I click on the green background, if I drag to the right, it will lighten it. If I drag to the left, it'll darken it. I like it nice and dark. Same thing if I was to click on the yellow in the flower and I drag it to the right, it's going to lighten the flower. To the left, it's going to darken the flower. So maybe we want to lighten that flower up just a little bit more than it was. Maybe something about there. There we go. So you continually can change it. All right. That gives you a quick idea of what you can do with perfect black and white. It's really fun because you can take an image that originally wasn't very exciting and you can really create something completely different with it. We'll just apply that. And when it comes back here into perfect layers, you can see the results are on their own layer. And when we save this, it's a regular layered, uh, multi-layered PSD file. If I went up in Photoshop, I would have those exact same layers in it. All right, back to browse. And you notice that right next to it, there's that new file that we created. Remember when we opened it, we said make a copy. So there's the original and there's my resulting image. All right, I think I have time for a couple more images here. Let's see, do I have any questions out there before we move on too far? There was a really good question in there about what camera and lens you were using while you were shooting these. 
Oh, uh, that's a good question. Now, let's take a look. Uh, what was the one we were just the one we were just on? Was photograph right here in the info pane? It tells us this was a Fuji Finepix. This is really old. This is like 2003. This is an ancient, ancient image. Um, and I honestly don't remember what lens that was. Uh, it was 105 millimeters. I don't know what actual lens it was. Uh, I think the other one. Uh, this one actually was from an Imacon digital back, so that's why it uh, uh, shows up with no metadata on it. And this one, the one we're going to go to now, is actually from a uh, Canon EOS 20D. And this is a raw image. So I'm just going to click on layers. Again, I'm going to open a copy as a PSD. There we go. And just like we've done before, name my layer, make a copy of it to get started. Now we're ready to get to work. Now here's an image with a whole lot of dust. So I'm going to grab my retouch brush again. I like to zoom into about 50% to start to get rid of these big chunkies. Again, that retouch brush is super fast for these little dust spots like this. And I'm probably not going to catch all of these guys, but we're probably going to change or replace the background on this image anyway, so I don't have to get everything. I do want to make sure I get any really big ones, and then I get any that are on the flower itself. While I'm spotting here, do we have any questions out there, Liz? There was a question about if you, if you really like the idea of Call putting me. a uh, cyanotype look on your image, but you want to change the color, can you do that? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely in black and white. The the cyanotype is just a preset, but you can fine tune those colors any way you want to. So you can uh, tweak the the hue of the blue or the brightness of the blue, or change it to any other color you want as well. It's just a preset to help you get started, but you have full control over what all the different uh, toners actually create. All right, there we go. That's probably good enough to get us started. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to recrop this image. We'll grab the crop tool, and I'm cropping to get rid of the cancel here. You see, there's a little piece of the background that I didn't get straight, and I can't take a level picture to save my life, so it's crooked as well. So I'm just going to recrop this image to make it a little bit more compelling. I'm going to use the rule of third lines in the crop guides to kind of position. the head of that tulip right around that third line. There we go. Make it a little bit more interesting to look at. And then we're going to send it off to Enhance. I kind of use Enhance as my first step in a lot of images. It gives me the ability to go through and uh, do the brightness and color corrections before I send it to Perfect Effects or one of the other modules to do my work. It's, it's kind of my camera raw, if you will. So I'm going to send it to Enhance. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set those white and black points. Again, easy way to do that, just to click that Auto Levels button. Again, that sets the white and the black. In this case, it's turned the top of the tulip a little too close to white for my taste. A good way to look at that is you can always go to the histogram view up here, and you can see uh, my little go-to-meeting doohickeys in the way, but you notice there's this tiny little red uh, stripe right here. That means just a little bit of the red color channel is getting clipped, which is just this little bit up here. So what I want to do is just pull this white back down just to make sure that I'm not clipping any of those whites in there. There we go. And then use the shadow control to bring up the shadows a little bit. And then I'm going to remove the color cast. This has kind of a warm color cast. This is probably just photographed with an incandescent light bulb. Nothing fancy, just an overhead incandescent bulb. To correct that, an easy thing to do is use the dropper tool. I know that my background is supposed to be gray, so I can just click on my background and voila, I've filtered off that offensive warm color cast. All right, that's all we're going to do here in Enhance. Now it's time to send it to effects. All right. In effects, what I want to do is I want to enhance and have control over the colors. A great way to do that is using the 
color enhancing filter right here. The color enhancer will automatically correct color cast. I'm going to turn that off. I kind of like it the way it is here. But it allows you to uh, select an individual color range in the image and then adjust its hue or saturation or brightness. So from this color range pop-up, I'm going to start by selecting green. Now I'm only going to affect just the greens in the image, just the stem. I'm going to shift the color of the greens slightly cooler. This will make the greens appear more green without oversaturating the greens. And I'm going to lighten them just a wee bit too. There we go. Let me just turn that on and off so you can see. It's kind of a subtle little change. So I took that green stem. I made sure I pulled out any yellow from it so that it's a nice, clean, real green. Now at the same time, we can actually start to work on the other colors. Let's zoom in a little bit here. I'm just going to zoom up to 100% and let's take a look at the head of the tulip. And I'll grab the red color range. So now I'm only affecting the reds. And I'm just going to increase the brightness of the reds and the saturation of the reds a little bit. And you can see how it's, again, only affecting those red colors. Now we'll grab the orange color range. The oranges are these subtle little uh, colors in this top petal. Now I could shift these to the left and completely change the color of the flower. I actually really kind of like those yellow, so I'm going to push them even further to the yellow. There we go. And maybe lighten those up just a little bit as well. There we go. Let's take a look at the before and the after. That's before and after. Again, it's just a subtle lightening and taking those yellows and making them a little bit more yellow. Cool. Now, at this point, I want to apply this effect to nothing but the flower. I want to make sure that none of these adjustments are applying to my background. Now, right now, it probably doesn't look like a big deal, but as we start to add more steps to this here in a minute, we'll start to change the, what the background looks like. So I'm just going to grab my brush and make sure I turn the perfect brush on, make sure it's set to paint out, and now I'm just going to start to paint out the effect off the background. While we're doing this, let's turn on that side-by-side -side mask view. This makes it a little bit easier to see what I'm doing while I paint. So you always work on the right, but you can preview on the left over here. So you can see as I paint along this edge, it's automatically finding the edge and stopping for me. Don't worry if it creeps into little spots. We'll come back and we'll clean those up here in just a minute. All right, once I get around the base of my flower, I'll just turn perfect brush off make my brush a little bit bigger here and I'll just clean up the rest very quickly. There we go. And then to come back, oops. Oh, wouldn't you know. Sorry, my bad there. There we go. Then to clean up these last little spots, again, hold down that option key while you paint, and that's going to invert. It's going to make it paint the opposite direction. You can continue to make your brush smaller to really oops, turn my perfect brush back on here. Sorry, it's not very exciting watching me do these fine tuned brush strokes here. There we go. That gets our mask complete.
I'm just going to go back to our normal view. What that does is it only applies these color adjustments to just the flower, nothing to the background. Now as we start to add more effects on top of this, I can use that same mask over and over again, just like we did before. So now I'm going to go in and I'm going to add a layer. And now I'm going to use the dynamic contrast tool. There we go. Now you notice when I add dynamic contrast without the mask, it starts to amplify all the noise in the background and the dust spots that I didn't see. I really don't want my background to be affected at all. So what we'll do is we'll just use the mask from the previous layer on top of it. So we'll go back and we'll just drag that mask up. There we go. Now it applies the dynamic contrast, but only to the flower. Pretty handy to be able to make those masks portable and carry them around. There we go. You can now adjust your dynamic contrast settings. I'm just going to use the, well, let's use the natural preset. If I use the surreal preset, it's going to be very, very strong. I think natural does a good job here. There we go. And then the last thing I want to do is I want to apply a texture to my background without applying it to the image to give the background a little bit more interest. I'll add another empty layer. I'm going to bring my preset browser on the left back up. And we'll go down to the texturizer. And we'll use that quick view browser. This will pop up and let me preview different background options or basically their textures, but I'm only going to apply it to the background so it works effectively like a new background. Let's go with the grunge vignette light. That's one of my favorite go-tos. We'll add that. You notice how that kind of darkens the corners a little bit, adds a little bit of grunge to the background, but it's also affecting the flower in the foreground. We don't want that. So again, we'll go back, we'll use that same mask technique that we've used a couple times where we drag and drop the mask, and then we're just going to invert the mask. There we go, just like that. Let's take a look at our before and our after. There's before, the original image, and after, using a little bit of perfect effects. All right, any questions? There were quite a few questions out there about using the texturizer. Maybe you could go just a little bit more in depth on how to make changes okay. to a texture. Sure. Sure. Actually, let's, I will do that on the next image because this image is kind of a dark background. There's not a whole lot uh, to be able to see, but let's go to the next one. We'll have a lot more control over it. And this will be our last one that we'll work on today. Select the image I want. This happens to be a raw image, so you notice I have to edit a copy. This one was from a 5D Mark II, so a little bit bigger image than the other ones. Make my copy. Let's clean up some of these dusties. I learned late in life that uh, you're supposed to have the camera turned off when you change lenses. That's helpful. There we go. Let's get a couple of these other little imperfections in the flower cleaned up. Bonus points to anybody out there who actually knows what the heck kind of flower this is. I have no idea. I am unfortunately not a botanical expert, so. <laughs> I figured somebody out there would know what it was. I know that there's a plant called euphorbia. That uh, I learned that the other day, and I thought that was a good word, but I have no idea what it is. You know, I actually have one planted in my yard. All right, <laughs> let's go ahead, and I'm going to send this one to, well, let's go straight to effects. That way we can kind of focus on some of those textures. There we go. Oops, hang on. I'm going to close up that preset drawer so we have a bit more room to work. And I'm going to use the adjustment brush right here. And I'm going to use that detail preset again. This is the way I start out on a lot of images. Where what I'm trying to do is define the interesting part of the image. I'm going to use it to paint some extra detail 
onto the, I believe that is the stamen and pistil. I'm sure there's a more versed biology person out there who will tell me I'm probably incorrect on that. Now I'm just going to paint more detail out on these petals. I'm using that perfect brush so it's automatically only applying it to just the same color so it's stopping at the background for me. There we go. I can turn that mask preview on. You can always do it with just a control M and that's the same on Mac and Windows. Control M will let you turn on that mask and let you preview it right on the image as well so you can kind of continue to adjust. Don't always have to be perfect either. It just we want to make sure we're not creeping out into areas that we're not interested in. It's always kind of cool watching the perfect brush work, the way it just kind of magically expands and knows where to stop. There we go. Now with that detail slider, we can control how much detail to add. Let's crank up the detail. I'm also going to increase the compression again. That compression is the one that's going to even out the lighting. It's going to uh, bring up the shadows and push down the highlights. There we go. Let's just turn the preview on and off so you can see the difference. See just that one little effect, just brushing in some detail and compression really makes that flower pop out a bunch more. Also let you see where you need to continue brushing a little bit too. I'm going to brush just a bit more out the end of some of these petals. Hold down the option key if you got a little too far out there just to clean that edge up a little bit. There we go. All right, now let's add a texture. So I'll click on the plus button, add an empty layer. I'll bring open my presets on the left again. We'll go down to the texturizer. I'll use that quick view browser. It makes it really handy to see my options. You can use the slider down here at the bottom to increase or decrease the number of rows that you see. So basically you can make those thumbnails bigger and smaller, or you can use the plus and minus key on your keyboard. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit closer and now we can go shopping for a texture for the background. <laughs> Let's see. You can see there are lots of options in here. I'm going to see if there's one that really jumps out at me. You know, how about this warm swirl? That looks like it might be kind of fun. There we go. We'll add that texture. And you notice it's applied over the entire image. We don't want it on the whole image. I just want it on everything except for what I've painted in. So again, we'll just copy and paste the mask. I'll just drag the mask up and invert the mask, and there we go. Now we've applied that to just the background area that we want. We can tune that mask up a little bit too if we need to, but, uh oh, oh no. I might not be able to show you more about using the texturizer. What you guys don't know is I'm actually using a pre-release version of an update to the Perfect Photo Suite that will be coming out soon and apparently I've stumbled into a bug and I can't show you the rest of the texturizer pane. I apologize for that. Uh, normally in a texturizer pane you'd be able to um, uh, pick the texture you want to use, control its brightness and uh, its saturation, move it around, all sorts of things to really control where that a texture appears and how it's applied other than just picking the texture itself like we did in the quick view browser but apparently I have 
discovered a bug here and it isn't drawing the rest of the pane today. I apologize for that. So, all right. Well, Liz, do you have any questions out there that we can answer? Well, I did have a really good question in there, but I have to point out that there's a very wonderful person named Steven who discovered what type of flower he thinks this is. And I was very oh, impressed. Okay. Um, could you really quickly introduce how to copy, paste, invert masks again? I got a couple of questions mm -hmm. in there from people who are confused because you were doing it pretty quickly. Yes. Yeah, no, I can definitely do that. Now, there's a couple of different ways to do it. I'm just going to clear out the mask on this layer. So whatever layer you have selected, the things in the mask menu apply to that layer. So I'm just going to say reset mask. So there's no mask on this layer at all. It's completely white. The texture is being applied to the entire image. To copy and paste a mask, all you do is go to the layer that has the mask that you want. In this case, it's the mask that's painting the effect only onto the flower. And there's two ways that you can copy and paste it. One way, the simplest way, is just to drag and drop. Just click on the thumbnail for the mask and drag it to the layer that you want it to go. And that will copy and paste the mask. The other way you can do it is to, from the mask menu, you can just pick copy mask, then click on the layer that you want to work on, go back to that mask menu and say paste mask. And then to invert that mask, you go to the mask menu and select invert mask, or you can use the command I or control I keyboard shortcut, and that'll flip it around. That means it'll apply to the exact opposite of what you had it applying to before. So you can see what was black is now white and vice versa. That's one of the handiest tools in the suite for me, because oftentimes you want to apply effect to one area, and then you want to apply to the another effect to the inverse of the same area. So copy and pasting those masks is really handy and powerful. One of the other questions that Any I other got, questions out there? I got a couple of the, um, the same questions in there about when you sharpen your images and how you sharpen them. Mm -hmm. mm. So for sharpening, there's two reasons that you would sharpen. One is the original image is not uh, as sharp as you'd like, and you're sharpening for an effect. You're trying to bring up uh, uh, sharpness to uh, in a certain local area. And a lot of times when I'm using, uh, when I want to do that, that's where I'm using the adjustment brush, and I'm using the detail option. And that really lets me paint in uh, extra detail or sharpness just where I'm interested in. The other time you use sharpening is when you're sharpening to compensate for the printer. So when you actually print an image onto paper or you show an image on the computer screen, it is going to lose a little bit of sharpness because the ink spreads out on the paper or different monitors vary in terms of sharpness. You make an image smaller, it loses sharpness on the computer screen. That's when you use uh, the sharpening for output. And to do that, let's just add an empty layer right here. And I'll show you how to add sharpening. Go to the filter pop-up and pick sharpening. This sharpening is designed for that second case where we're applying sharpening to the entire image to compensate for um, uh, dot gain on the printer when the printer loses sharpness. There's presets for whether you're showing it on a computer screen or using it on a printer. And then there's additional presets based on the type of paper and the subject matter. So you can really dial in just what you want. So let's say I'm going to print this on glossy paper and I want lots of sharpening so I can pick the print glossy high option. And this automatically dials in the right amount of sharpening detail and protection right here. Now typically I actually do this inside of uh, perfect resize instead because that's where I'm really preparing my image for print because I can crop it and resize it at the same time, apply the right amount of sharpening, everything I need up to the printing process. I would do that in resize most of the time instead. But we put it here inside of perfect effects so that you have access to it here if you're not going to uh, print it right away and you want to send it somewhere else. All right, anything else? I had one last question here I wanted to ask you about was, um, can you import or load your own textures? Yes, you definitely can do that. Um, to do that, go up to your 
well, in inside of Perfect Effects where I'm at right now, you would go to Presets and Manage Extras, or if you're in Layers or in Browse, you go to File and Manage Extras, and this will bring up the Extras Manager. And from here, you can import your own backgrounds, borders, and textures, as well as manage your presets for black and white effects, enhanced portrait and resize. So to add your own texture, all you do is you would click on the texture category. And if I roll this down, you'll see I've actually got some different uh, uh, textures that I've added already. There's some of my personal textures that I've put in for my category. There's Liz's great uh, Boca collection and another one from Photomorphous. To add my own, all I do is just click the import button, point it to a texture that I want to use, and it will suck it right in here, and then it will appear inside of the texturizer inside of effects or in the uh, textures inside of layers that you can use anywhere in the suite. You can also create your own categories and uh, move and delete content here inside of the Extras Manager. All right. Well, I thank you guys for watching today. Again, this webinar is recorded, so you can always watch it again later. Hopefully it was helpful to you guys, and uh, look forward to seeing you guys in more webinars in the future. And thanks, Liz, for all your help. Thanks, you guys.